This is the DRF Players Podcast. Here are your hosts, Peter Thomas Fornatel and Jonathan Kinchin. Hello and welcome to the DRF Players Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornatel, very far from the Brooklyn Bunker. It's early in the morning, some would say the middle of the night actually, in San Diego, California, where I am at a Hilton Garden Inn on Murphy Canyon Road. Not too far from where the Padres used to play baseball and the Chargers used to play in the NFL before they moved up the street and all their fans gave up on them. Out here for a week away, uh, we're going to be doing lots of fun kid things. Can't wait. Hitting the safari park later. Um, Had a great meal the other night at one of my favorite restaurants in the world, the Pacific Coast Grill. Watched the sunset there while getting reports from Del Mar, where I'd been all day, on the phone. And uh, one of the folks I was communicating with about Del Mar on the day is a guy you know well. He's on the show almost all the time, though though he has had a little bit of time off lately. But I, I think he's back and ready for a nice rhythm and uh, he's the people's champion, Jonathan Kinchin. JK, what's up? PTF, what's going on? You, you staying uh, staying uh, warm out there? Or, and I'd, I'd imagine, and I'd imagine some breweries uh, are, are aware of your presence. <laughs> yes, we've hit three so far, and uh, another pure project on the list today. We were at Fall in the North Park area yesterday, and I really. Uh, enjoyed the vibe and they sort of surprising sometimes you go to a brewery and you see they do like nine different styles of beer or whatever and I get a little nervous because it's like just logically hey are you you know it's not not unlike a horse player it's unlikely that the same guy who's great at uh, you know making figures is also going to be somebody who's a whiz with trainer stats you know people tend to specialize and I think that's true with food and beer as well and this place had everything from you know Berliner Weiss to barrel aged stouts, but they were good across the board. Um, not surprisingly, the hoppy stuff, probably the best stuff. It is, you know, the sort of the local specialty. But there were a lot of good beers on the list at, at fall in North Park. And uh, excited to to do some more as we as we go along here. It's a, such a great city. Every time I come here, I feel a little bit at home. I feel like this is a place I could definitely move. And I'm also struck by how incredibly kid friendly it is out here i'm sure you found similar absolutely one of my favorite places uh, in the world is is uh, the little beach kind of neighborhood of la jolla which is kind of in between downtown and uh in del mar so I, I i always and it's not like it's funny like that the whatever la jolla is i don't really like it in other places like i'm not a huge beach guy like a beach town guy i, I it just doesn't uh, it's too sandy, and I it gets in my shoes, and it makes me mad. Um, for whatever reason, though, La Jolla doesn't annoy me. I like La Jolla very much. I'm sure they're very pleased. They're very pleased to be to be at home to you. We'll be having brunch in La Jolla at the world famous Brockton Villa. Hopefully, uh, with the cool air, uh, the se- we won't we won't have any seal fragrance, and we can sit out on the deck. Can always sit inside when the seals are are out in in full bloom. Hey, I forgot a little bit of housekeeping at the top of the show. J.K., this is show three eight six, the Tuesday, November twentieth edition. We're actually recording part of the show today for once. It seems on the day when the show is going to be going live. We've had between our both of our crazy travel schedules, things have been a little bit different lately and that's uh that's no exception today and the second half of the show remember last week we had the appearance with pat cummings we had a lot of people say nice things about it thank you all for that but um we didn't get to talk to pat about the other thing we wanted to so the second half of today's show is going to be me chatting with pat about the new white paper from the thoroughbred idea foundation about interference rules now you got to listen to this with pat if you haven't already jk but I mean, I think they really have this nailed down. And my opinion about it has evolved even since I interviewed Pat about a week ago. And it's evolved to just thinking he's and they are totally right in the way they're suggesting this to try to get stewards essentially reducing the amount of difficult decisions they have to make, reducing the amount of time that they have to play God. And I really think in the big picture, while it's not without a cost for horses who were fouled and, you know, maybe there's there's certainly some who clearly would have gotten minor placings that under the new system wouldn't. In the big picture of life, 
the way they're looking at the world here, very, very smart. And Pat explains it very well. So we'll have that coming up. Is this a subject? Did you read the whole white paper at this point? Have you, uh, do you have an opinion on it? I do think that, you know, I, I think that both, you know, two things can come from this. A, consistency, which I think is something that we've all kind of uh, hoped for when it comes to these decisions. Uh, just a, a, consi- a more consistent uh, set of rules and a, a more consistent way of adjudicating um, those situations. So that obviously is, is one part of it. The other thing is is just reducing it, you know, getting, like you said, getting – getting the stewards hands out of the cookie jar a little bit um, and, and kind of, uh, you know, the, the least that we can have them involved, the better and, um, uh, and better for the betters. So, uh, no, I'm, I'm definitely on board. I, I actually did the, uh, did the little survey that I don't think it came out with their, with, I don't know if they released a survey or if someone else did it secondarily. It was somebody else. Were. And it was, it was a poorly, it was as an editor and as a critical thinker and somebody who, as a marketer, I didn't like the survey, man. I thought it, I thought it has the potential to do more harm than good because I, I just don't think it teed up the issues in an editorially cohesive way. It was the kind of thing where, and, and I'll say this out there to industry people listening, you know, I'll do free consulting for important issues. And that was one where I think my services could have been used. I actually, now that you mention it, I, I kind of see where you're where you're coming from. It wasn't the the easiest of of things, but I I just thought that the basic idea of 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 giving your opinion based on seeing the tape, I, I thought that was, uh, I thought that was you know yes. interesting. I was watching it with another horse player, and and we even disagreed at times on certain on certain situations. But but I, I think the problem with that is, and and what they like maybe to your point, what they could have gotten across a little bit better is do not don't don't vote based on what you think would happen correct like tomorrow at at at, at aqueduct or del mar on what should happen is, is, is how you were supposed to vote on that so i think that's where it was a little bit confusing because that wasn't really clear yeah the the thing that i like the most about it is the the reduction of the difficulty of the job i'll, I'll be honest really reading through the rules of category one and category two for the first time, <laughs> I'll admit, as someone who's uh, like all horse players have bashed stewards from time to time, but I had sympathy for them about just how difficult the job is under the current system. And when you see that there's this alternative and oh, by the way, it works everywhere else in the world. And so I think that will limit. I mentioned to Pat when we talked about it the first time, as you'll hear later in the show, my a little bit of fear about the law of unintended consequences. But the fact that this has been battle tested throughout the world, except for North America, without bad results, with better results. Um, anyway, we'll let Pat talk all about it. If we've gone, we kind of started at the end here. Um, and we really go in and talk about this from from soup to nuts. So enjoy that interview, hopefully. Pat, always a pleasure to have on the show. Been really cool to have a bunch of him lately. And we just have a few more minutes, JK, today to yap, maybe talk about some questions. Um, I had a lot of fun hanging with Frank Scatoni on Sunday at Del Mar. I did his little seminar. We had, uh, I, I haven't checked yet, but he, he said, uh, he, he was very impressed with the amount of people who watched live. And so I, of course, got competitive and was like, all right, well, what's the most, what's the most amount of views you've gotten? And he said, you know, 1,200 or whatever it was. And I said, and who was that? He said, oh, it was your, your buddy JK. And I said, oh, I'll crush him. No, no, no chance in the world <laughs> that he gets more than me. So we'll, we'll, I haven't checked back to see if I, uh, if I got the nod. But I, I, I like the idea. One way or the other, I like the idea of the DRF Players Podcast crew catching the exacta on that one. So that, no, don't <laughs> you worry. Uh, we, 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 you, you brought up a little, you know I'm competitive. And uh, you better get on your horse, big fella, because you're at 800 views right now. Oh, no. Oh, oh you and and you were the first one. You were the first one. So I mean, you you were really at a disadvantage. So uh, yeah, you, you better uh, you better get your uh, you better get your retweet on. <laughs> we managed to give out a few winners. Frank had a great, just such a good old school handicapping case. I wish I could remember the name of the horse on a twenty five to one shot that ended up running second. He cashed a nice place bet. Um, 
I had the one night, a couple of shorties and uh, the five to one winner in the race with uh, where with Omaha Beach. And I, I probably should have tweeted my mean line about Omaha Beach after that race, JK, uh, uh, folks didn't see. It was it was a classic uh, four to five shot, has the entire length of the stretch to get by the winner who'd done enough work that he should be tiring and did not. Um, and, and my line to Frank was, it's a good thing I texted him and I said, it's a good thing that the men at Omaha Beach had more metal than the equine Omaha Beach or this text would be in German. <laughs> Been reading a lot about World War II lately, so I was happy to get to make the jokes as well. Um, little historical references now and again. But there was one, uh, you did some excellent handicapping and really good bet construction on the day, managing to pull out a nice win in the early pick five, despite it being, I think, was it all, I think it was all five favorites, and if it wasn't, it was close, and some of them were prohibitive. And after the fourth leg, I reached out to you and said, you know, is this a situation where we're even going to get back the money we put into it? And as it turned out, with three horses in there, the return was between... It was more than double, more than double the money, uh, and considerably more in one of the options. And I was just impressed by that, and and curious to ask you how you, uh, what wizardry with which you, you with which you may, were able to make those tickets that even on such an obvious occurrence uh, you were able to uh, to get it into the positive. Right, like we talked about before, the the idea is is you know we spend hours and hours handicapping, and we construct our tickets as we're walking to the window, and I've. I've tried to transform the game for myself and, and doing a little bit differently. And, and, uh, so the long story to that is, is that I quickly handicapped the, not quickly handicapped the races, but I handicapped the races and, and saw the horses that I thought were likely winners and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm trying to remember there was a horse. The reason I played the sequence was a horse I wanted to fade. There was and a horse was in the th- racing. Yeah, there was a horse I, in the third race that was very cl- going to take a ton of money and very clearly get a rail trip. I'm guessing that might be the one. Yeah, I think I think you're right. And, and the so rail has not you know, been good at Del Mar. Uh, no, it's not been ideal. So, um, long story short, I I just I kind of waited it just in the, kind of the Dutch Dutch, uh, um, you know, formula that we've kind of not the formula the, like the Dutch mindset where essentially the the more likely the combination the the more i have it so you know i think we had the the favorite for like a 40 dollar like a 40 dollar pick, pick four which which was pick which five. helped us makes pick five excuse me helped us make some money there so yeah. all all it was was just you know taking some time and laying out uh, some some different combinations to make sure that uh make sure that, that you had more, we had more money on on the things that i i thought were more likely to happen we didn't get a chance at I almost said Saratoga at at, uh, at at Louisville when we did the Equestricon betting construction panel to talk fully enough about the Dutch tool and uh, Papo Morales was on there who is a guy Google him you know not, I don't not in the business of mentioning DRF's uh, competitors too I uh, can't be handing out the plugs too too willy nilly or you won't hear me again on here but if you google Popo you'll figure out where he works and he's helped develop a tool that does um, some of this dutching for you and you could certainly look at what that tool throws up and bet them in your DRF bets account too. It's not only something that can be used with the, the home uh, the home ADW where Papa works. But the other guys on the panel were a little skeptical about the validity of dutching, this idea of betting combinations to yield the same amount. In other words, I'll just use a simple example. You're talking about a double and you like two horses in the first leg and two horses in the second leg and one is a long shot and one is a favorite and the idea basically being you want to bet it so you're going to have obviously much more favorite favorite to yield the same amount if you get one of the long shot in one leg with favorite combinations in the others and you'll even have a similar return if it goes long shot to long shot, maybe just a small denomination on the two long shot combinations. And I think a lot of people intuitively think, well, you're supposed to have more if it's long shot to long shot, because that's going to be where the the value is. 
And the answer is maybe, you know, it depends a lot on the specifics. But what I really like about the dutching concept is that you can take a wager like a double, like an exacta, like a pick three or pick four, even if you want to get really creative and do some of your own math. And you can know, or at least have some idea, not precise, but you can know with some degree of certainty what the whole bet pays as if it was an odd in the wind pool. In other words, I'm making the, these many combinations in my double, but if I hit, um, it's going to come back at least three to one. And I think there's some value in that. And part of it has to do with what you were saying a minute ago, JK, that at that point it almost becomes, if you can use so many horses and construct intelligent tickets in that way, that it almost becomes a case of who are you beating? And if I can know that I'm going to get three to one and I'm fading, you know, a favorite I don't like in each leg and it's mean to say, but you could, I've heard gamblers use the expression, uh, throwing out the trash, tossing the rags, you know, not playing the, the whatever, however you want to say it, taking the, the chaotic elements that you really just think have no chance. You don't have those and you're fading a couple of horses and you can see the exact return that will get. And then you can make a decision intelligently. Well, okay, that return is worth that risk or it's not. And that extra amount of certainty you can get when wading into these pools, I just think it's, uh, I think it's something that, that leads to a lot better decisions. And um, it's just been a point that's been kicking around my head that I wish I'd made at that panel that uh, I just kicked out. Now, I, I, as someone who I know does this a lot, I, I assume you think of it somewhere uh, somewhat similarly. Do you have anything to piggyback onto that or correct? No, I try to... <clears throat> I try to... Um, you know, at least I try, it's hard, but I try to do a little bit of a hybrid version of, of that. You know, obviously there is some Dutch tools that, that are, that aren't really, you can't really toggle them, but they're just kind of like, it, it is what it is. It's going to give you that same return regardless based on the pools. Um, I, I do, I do, I have kind of worked on the ability to kind of adjust that a little bit. So say for, for instance, if, 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 a, if a horse is two to one, um, I, I've kind of found a way and it's just really, it's way too in depth for this conversation, but found a way to kind of value the horse lower or higher. If I feel that that's necessary to press the horse or two to one, semi I don't really fade like the horse. Yeah. Exactly. I, I can, I can fade the horse and make him essentially quote unquote four to one. If I love the horse, I can essentially make him even money uh, and press him a little bit. So there's some ways that you can kind of hybrid the, 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 the basic Dutch concept into being, more opinion based, but but a lot of times what I'll do, um, in in situations is try to hit a pick three or pick four, you know, with that with that traditional handicapping machismo of singling some horse that's nine to two, that that, that makes everyone feel warm and fuzzy from a handicapping standpoint, <laughs> and then use Dutch principles around that horse to extract more money for the nine to two shot and turn him into a ten to one, fifteen to one shot. By using the the pick, the pick four pool or the or the pick three pool to 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 leverage that opinion, but the races surrounding it where I don't have those those handicapping bang your chest opinions, I just catch whatever happens in those situations and I catch it efficiently. Well, that's very smart. And another thing that you can do, of course, with uh, using these Dutch type principles, is make that the bulk of your play, 80%, 90% of your play, and then come back with a certain percentage of your money, the rest of your money, as a as a kill bet, as Mike Maloney talks about in, uh, in betting with an edge, where you just take, you maybe play $100 spreading, three by two or whatever, and then you just come back with $10 of just the two numbers that you like. Tommy Massis will hear this in Bristol and say it should be, you know, all kill bet. And if you've got the betting personality to make that work, I don't disagree exactly. I do think there's something to being super aggressive when you have a strong opinion and just letting the chips fall where they may. For my betting personality and my bankroll, I need to cash more than that. And I can't, I don't, I don't, I just don't have it in me to go through the losing streaks where if you're just playing one cold number or two cold numbers in the double that you have to do. But that's something we talk about all the time. You, you learn about this stuff and you take all the information and then you tailor it to your own, uh, to your own needs. 
I had a handicapping specific question for you, JK, because we never really talked about it, but it was a bit of disagreement that we had in that early pick five sequence. And, you know, it's, it's silly to take one result that happened. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you were, you were right and I was wrong. But in this case, it it seemed like you were pretty clever to want to fade the, uh, the coil Richie Baltus first time on the turf horse that had decent numbers on dirt but importantly to me really interesting looking turf breeding all the way around and you seemed extremely against the horse I just wanted to talk to you a little bit more about why that was yeah you know we've talked about the 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 uh the workout report stuff and 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 we talk about how we've we've you know it's obviously important to both of us but we we kind of look at it differently and uh, you got to be careful judging turf horses on dirt, da, 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 whatever. Yeah. yeah. Well, the horse was coming off of a break since March 17th, um, had run like some really competitive and fast numbers on the dirt. So the horse clearly is a dirt horse, not saying that he can't turf, but he is a dirt horse. So when I noticed that his workouts were not good on the dirt, it made me realize that I don't care if he is a turf horse. He is a dirt horse who's not working well on the dirt, so he's clearly not in good form. He's not fit. He's not ready to rock and roll. Even if he loves the turf, it doesn't make a difference because he's already shown that he's a good dirt horse. It's not like there's going to be this hidden move up when he switches back to the turf because he's already – you know what I'm saying? So that was – and it was it was Baltus. I knew he was going to take money. Um, I thought there was a bunch of other speed in the race, so that was kind of one of his weapons, and it – it was probably more aggressive, you know, I was, last week was pretty good. So I think maybe that was why I was feeling so aggressive, um, um, in that situation. And, and it just turned, it turned out to, to, to be, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. but the horse wasn't really bad either. He was five to one. I, I expected him to be much shorter than that. Let me ask you this. You said the work, the recent workouts on dirt were not good. And when you say they weren't good, they weren't good relative to his body of work. In other words, he'd had good dirt works when his form was good. Then the workout pattern changed. And that made you think maybe, well, maybe they're just trying something here since he hasn't been working well on the dirt. Was that, is that what you're saying? Right. I mean, it was it was that, but it, it was more it was more of the of the idea that you know I'm trying to identify if he's going to run well today, and 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 his last work one of the lines was a bit flat in final drill when coming home on the wrong on lead. Yeah, that was on the dirt. That sounds off form. So I, so I just said to myself, "What, what was that? that?" That sounds like a horse who's not in form. Right. So I just said, okay, well, he is a good dirt horse. If he's not working well on the dirt, then he's not, you know, he's, he's not coming into this in his, his yeah. best. So whether he likes it or not, it's not going to matter. He, he's not, uh, he's, his mind is not in the right place. I like it. And I, I either misread or you mistyped the original text. I put this on the list to just talk about it on the show because I thought it might be interesting. But I, I had read the text is you thought he was a dirt horse and working well on the dirt. And that's why you didn't like him on the turf. And I was going to have to have some questions about that. But what you're saying now is making absolutely perfect sense to me. So anyway, again, we don't mean to say you're not a genius for getting one thing right. You're not even necessarily right in the big picture of life getting one data point right. But it's just interesting interesting to to think this stuff through and i think sometimes some of the fun conversations we have on here or when we just have the conversations we'd have in real life but we do it on the air and two different workout reports by the way um had c plus on the last one uh the, the one that i had read the other one said like to see one off the break oh that's interesting that's so interesting. It, it, it was just there was a lot of suggestions that uh, we weren't going to see the best from that one. And there you go. That's such a, uh, especially in California, an example of how the market is affected by the workout reports. You know, I mean, I think you're right. This is a horse that without that information out there is going to be three to one probably, or at least seven to two. But everybody is... uh, Everybody's a wise guy in 2018. It's one of the reasons why the game is so much harder than it ever was before. There's a lot of good information out there. There's a lot of efficient betting out there. And it's more important than ever that you try to stick to your best opinions and that you try to do everything right the 100% job handicapping, taking time to bet. You can't, there's not a lot of money out there to just pick up 
loose mistakes from the world. The world is pretty smart, and uh, it's something you have to think about and also is one of the reasons why I still think contests are such a great opportunity because not that there aren't many smart contest players, there are, but I still feel like when you're competing against that limited subsection of horse players, you still have a better opportunity for, for scores um, and are getting, have more of a chance to get the best of it. And I actually had a professional horse player, won't name names here because I didn't ask for permission to do so, but a professional horse player whose name many people uh, know listening to the show, not somebody who's not one of the people we mention all the time, but very well-known sharp player uh, looking over the Breeders' Cup betting challenge plays and saying this is the best based on these plays, and he didn't mean to be insulting, but looking at how many people who make that contest are just qualifying and turning money over and looking to walk away with something or just bet what they would have bet in the context of the contest, based on how many people were playing, based on their plays without really trying to win, he was convinced it was the best equity going in the Breeders' Cup betting challenge. And I thought that was an interesting takeaway from looking at the plays, that this made this pro player con- seriously consider wanting to play when he'd never played in the event before. I thought that was a pretty interesting take. For sure. No, I, I mean, I've, I, I've, maybe I've never said it out loud, but I've kind of felt it in my brain. Like, I, I, you know, I think like we've talked about before, we were talking about with Pat is, there's a, there's a handful of guys that are trying to win the thing and that are gonna that are gonna really uh, try to leverage the equity that that, that 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 shows up in that contest. And there's a lot of guys that are gonna that are gonna bet the minimums and 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 bet win play show and 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 you know just kind of get out. Um, and and those guys can't win. And so it, essentially their money is kind of in the middle for for others that are willing to to do what they have to do to win it to, to take and so I, I agree i think it's a there's a lot of equity in there and and you also saw some you know that not uh, you know a, a little bit not very much but a handful of silliness that, yes. that makes you feel there's plenty of silliness like what you're trying to do is 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 the right is the right approach yeah plenty of silliness we don't, we don't need to call anybody out but go look for yourself uh horse racing data sets.com robin howlett did a, a terrific job creating a more searchable, easily findable version. If you just want the PDF, you can find it on the Breeders' Cup website. For our last little bit, JK, before we bring in uh, Pat, we had a two-part question about the Breeders' Cup plays uh, from listener Mike. And the first part is, given that the desired outcomes from certain wagers is to deliver X result... Won't those decisions be dictated by the latest odds, which means that ticket construction is delayed until very late near post time? Perfect question, tying in everything we've been talking about today. It, it's tough. You know, on, on Breeders' Cup, it helps because the pools are so big. They don't move very much. Um, you know, it, it, you, don't get that, you don't get that weird thing in the, at the Breeders' Cup where, like, first flash, there's this horse favored, and then, like, it turns into another horse being favored. It, 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 I mean, it, I'm not saying it doesn't ever happen, but it's not as 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 uh, as rampant that it is as like you know during the week at Aqueduct or whatever Mahoney Valley or whatever it might be. Um, so it, it is tough, but yeah, you you, you kind of have to get you have to become a pretty good predictor of where things are going to go, and you can use the you know I think the you know the biggest tool you can use is the will pays, and just identifying where the favoritism is going to go and, and who's going to be bet where because those pools are closed so there's no moving in, in those pools and i think some would argue that the double will pay is probably sharper than the win pool anyways so um it, it's a better identifier of where things are going to go so I, I think that you have to try to predict where they're going to go and one of the tools to do that are the, are the will pays and the probable well said Here's the second part of this question. Using the Marshall Graham example of wagers went down to $720. Is his bet in the distaff uh, using Wowcat on the bottom driven by his low balance, or would he have made a similar bet on Wowcat if he had more money at that stage? Um, He speculates. I have to think it's driven by his need for a score. Uh, similarly, with Gunavera on his classic tickets, how does he play that if he had 40000 instead of 7000 uh, Mike says he's all about having an opinion coming into a race, but has to think that higher prices look better in the form when you need them late in a contest, which is an interesting point. Um, how are the top players constructing tickets in these instances? 
Well, I, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to speak for Marshall, but Marshall was always going to key Gunavera. So it, it, I guess it, it, you know, I'm sure in his pocket in real life, he keyed Gunavera. I would imagine in his pocket, he also uh, played Wildcat underneath. Um, I think that the way you, the way you express your opinion in a contest setting does adjust based on your, your, your goal, what you're trying to accomplish in the contest and where the leaderboard is. And so, um, in that situation, the way that Marshall hit the, the distaff and then, and then went on to hit the classic, I, you, you know, I'd have to say that he's a smart enough guy that, that, that what his bankroll was and where his, um, where his goal was and what the leaderboard was at did influence the decisions that he made and how he bet the races. But I don't think that it made a guy like Marshall reach for a horse that he didn't like or a, 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 or to, to, to create a handicapping opinion just based on, on where he was. I think he just probably bet it differently, um, possibly, than he would have based on the situation. And we can ask him, uh, obviously, and we will do that because uh, I think it's interesting. And, and my guess is, JK, that you're on to something that – this was probably the, the the strongest opinion that would get him there. And if he had more money, he would have added other combinations that would have gotten him there based around the same opinions on those two horses. But again, just taking a wild guess. Uh, last question related to this that I'll throw along um, is, heh, this is a great one too. With with so many tickets, how do, that you might come up with in, for example, a dutching strategy like we were talking about earlier, how are players such as yourself, JK, able to get so many tickets punched in time uh, in a contest like the Breeders' Cup Betting Challenge? Yeah, so that's kind of hard. One of the things that, that... – <sighs> okay, <laughs> so some machines and some contests have limits where, like, you could only do, like, a $100 straight thing or a $200 straight thing. That can be very, very annoying because essentially you have to hit repeat, 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 and remember how many repeats you're doing. That could be troublesome. Um, there's a lot of machines where you can go to the machine and you can type in $1,585 double four eight, and it will just take it. Those are obviously machines that are very friendly. You need to figure that out early in the day, what kind of machine you're going to be dealing with based on the tote system, so on and so forth. One of the things that I've always, I, I, at least I try to do is, I try to give myself like like three or four bets a minute or three or four lines a minute. So I'll go with minutes to post to make sure I can get all of those in. Well, let's, uh, you want to wait till the last that. possible minute in most situations, right, but, but just but depending on how you're doing it. So, you want to wait till the last um, possible minute, but the last possible minute, if you're punching that many tickets, is, is maybe seven minutes or 12 minutes even. Right. When, when did you, when you, not to bring up a sore subject, but when you went to make your doubles with Enable to the horses in the Classic, granted, maybe a little more straightforward since you only had one horse in the turf, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be different than it would be if it was a four by three double. Right. But w when did you make go up to make those enable plays? How many minutes to post in the turf? Well, one of the things I did there was this was a, a lesson I learned at Del Mar with when I made the real big double on the on the on the uh, on Roadster to 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 uh, uh, Unique Bella was that if you're gonna make a large wager, it's sometimes better to do it early so that you can make other combinations more attractive so that people play them. Uh, and you want to give them more time to see that. So if you load up on a combination, then it makes the other ones more attractive. Now, it was Breeders' Cup, so I'm not 100% sure it would have mattered. But immediately after the distaff, you put that uh, one or maybe in. about 10 minutes after the distaff, it's a really, really long uh, lead up until the, the turf. I bet I bet $5, a $5,000 double enable to my four horses like early because i knew that i was going to bet at least five thousand on each of them and then i waited until it got closer probably like four minutes to post i think is when i did it It was only four that i had to punch in and then i popped in the rest of them uh with the difference minus the five thousand of where i wanted to be on them and popped those in at, at the last minute as i as i could because there's nothing worse than it you know than a late shift and you just being in a bad position um but when you're only using one horse on one side, you don't have to nearly do it as often. But for a you know, more complicated play. contest, I've done, yeah. I've played doubles where I'm six by six or something. <laughs> so there's 36 lines you got to play. How long? You how much time would you leave for that? Yeah, how much time would you leave? Just for example. 
uh, th- if it was like 30, like yeah, that. Yeah, for 36, six by six, when are you going up there? How many minutes to post? I, I would, I would, I would tell myself I'm going to stand up at 11 minutes to post, and I'd go up there at 10 and just crank them out. It's amazing. And you have gotten shut out doing things like that, right? I feel like one time we were together, you didn't get the last three lines in or something. No, it, you can. If you wait to the last minute, you can absolutely get shut out, and so. Um, and that obviously makes it a little bit more challenging. Very cool. All right. Well, we touched on a lot of stuff here, JK. Thank you for uh, getting up early with me. Not as early as me, but getting up early with me. And uh, let's bring in, we'll let you go, and then we'll bring in Pat to talk about this new white paper. And now I'd like to welcome back to the DRF Players podcast, the, I don't know what your title is, the Poobah, the executive director, the, I don't know. He's very important when it comes to the Thoroughbred Idea Foundation. He's Pat Cummings. Pat, what's up? Hi, Pete. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> do, do you accept Poobah as a title? I do. Grand Poobah <laughs> would have been fine as well. So you guys have released a new white paper. Um, this one is about a cause that's near and dear to all horse players, particularly those of us who, I'm just going to say it, suffered through the Saratoga meeting um, with several head-scratching stewards' decisions. It's called Changing the Rules. The full paper and the executive summary are both available at racingthinktank.com. Pat, I wanted you to tell us about how you chose this topic and to give us a little bit of an overview. Folks can obviously read both the summary and the full paper, but I want to at least kick around some of the ideas for a while and get people thinking about this and inspire them to to go to the site to take a fuller look. Thanks, Pete. Uh, well, without question, you know, there were some, there was a lot of discussion uh, out of the 2018 Saratoga meet about what were or were not kind of consistent decisions uh, coming from the stewards. And, uh, you know, this is a, this is a cry that horse players have had for, for a long time about consistency across jurisdictions, slight changes in the rules in different places, different wordings, and uh, the decisions that are made and how they're applied and the impact of those. Um, and, and frankly, you know, there, there were some pieces from uh, Mike Watchmaker at the end of the, of the Saratoga meeting that just said this is maddening. The, the inconsistency in the decision, it seemed like what was a foul one day wasn't the next. And so, you know, we as an organization uh, decided to take a look at the issue. Um, you know, uh, the Thoroughbred Idea Foundation was organized as a group that was going to aim to tackle topics that maybe haven't necessarily been focused on for racing by other of the, you, know, you name the alphabet soup uh, organizations that are out there. Uh, and find topics that owners and horse players could see an improved experience with if, if, if this change was actually brought about. And when it came down to it, when we looked at the numbers, uh, we realized that, first off, there were a uh, considerable number of, of increased demotions from Saratoga this past summer than the previous year. So, so that feeling that there was more steward activity is, is accurate. Okay. Um, but what's very difficult to quantify, no matter what the jurisdiction is, is consistency. Uh, how groups of stewards are making decisions over time. Cause let's be fair. The panels change. Stewards take vacation. Uh, you have some guys will, that'll come in from, uh, uh, they're essentially kind of in the bullpen as, as the backup stewards for when others are on vacation. California switches their stewards ranks around. Um, th- there are changes that happen. And, and how can we find uh, a more consistent solution to maybe decrease the negative impact of these decisions? And is there an alternative to that? Is there a way to come up with a more fair, a more just, a more equitable result? Uh, is, there, um, is there an alternative? And based on the research that we did uh, in the paper, uh, we uncovered that not only is there an alternative, it's, it's what's used in the rest of the world, across the world, as the standard. It's known as uh, the Category 1 
interference philosophy, whereas what's in place in the U.S. and Canada is considered Category 2. And uh, the paper, while very long, uh, it's nearly 10,000 words, and you know it certainly requires a bit of an investment in time. And you can read the executive summary and get a, a sample of it if you want to uh, before diving in. I think it very clearly outlines that uh, racing in on this continent uh, and the experience for owners and gamblers would be improved with a much more consistent set of rules where people know what is or is not a foul for which a horse can be demoted and that more people on balance would be benefited by category one rules philosophy as opposed to what we have in place right now. Well, let's talk about the nuts and bolts. What is the difference between category one and category two? So what we have right now, Pete, is a situation in category two where if you are uh, the interfering horse, uh, you are placed behind the horse that suffered the interference with, without any regard for um, what the actual end result of the race may have been. Okay, so um, we, we look at a variety of examples within this, uh, within this uh, paper. Uh, I'll take a very uh, extreme example. There was a race at Woodbine in September. Uh, a two-year-old maiden special, uh, a horse by the name of She Calls It, goes on and she wins by over six lengths. Okay. Um, however, uh, turning for home, she caused two horses to steady around the quarter pole. Uh, and the stewards operating on the rules which are in front of them believe that the interference that was caused led to these horses not having uh, a chance for a better place. And a horse who won by six and a quarter lengths was disqualified. It's very clearly outlined in the category two rules. But uh, the stewards have to interpret very subjectively whether they believe this cost these horses a better placing. Would they have finished fourth instead of fifth or third instead of fourth? Uh, and there's a lot of subjectivity that, that, that's required there. And it pays no attention to the fact that this horse has just completely dominated the race, winning by six and a quarter lengths. In this case, the horse is disqualified or rather demoted from first and was placed fifth. In category one, the burden, the impact, where the decision is being made, all has to do with the projected positions of these horses. So category one states that if in the opinion of the stewards, the horse that caused the interference, uh, if that horse, uh, well, the horse that, that suffers the interference, Pete, uh, if that horse would not have finished ahead of the horse causing the interference, then the placings would not be changed. Right. So in the case of this Woodbine example, and we have video of this uh, at racingthinktank.com, so you can see a lot of these examples, um, she calls it win by six and a quarter lengths. The stewards in category one would have said, would the horses that were interfered with have, have finished ahead of she calls it? Uh, and the answer is very unequivocally no. <laughs> this horse was clearly the best horse on the day. So think of all of the times, and there are many of them, Pete, Oh. where a winner oh, I'm is having disqualified flashbacks. or I'm having, maybe, uh, yeah. A significant form at Saratoga, uh, looking at corners at Keeneland the other year. I'm thinking of all these instances when, when, when uh, of course, I, I happen to get the wrong end of the stick on them, which is probably why they, they remain burned in the memory. But we've seen this here time and time again where, according, and this is a great, I never really understood it as clearly as this. Yes, it's still subjective under category two but what the stewards are doing the way these rules are written is logical whereas under category one these decisions never would have happened this way and, and i do think it's more friendly right. to owners and horse players no doubt about it we estimate that there's probably about 10 million dollars a year that changes hands 
because of the decisions of the stewards. That's a rough estimate based on some of the numbers that we saw from New York and California over the last uh, over the last full year of 2017. In the paper uh, and on the website, we, we, we've put up the videos of some kind of big races where where these things have happened. The 2015 Beverly D at Arlington was a, a very uh, logical example. Secret Gesture wins the race by a length and a quarter, cause some interference to Stephanie's kitten who had to steady, and what's the chances comes on the outside and just grabs second away from Stephanie's kitten. Secret Gesture was very clearly going to be the winner of that race, interference or not. Okay. But uh, under the Category 1 rules, Secret Gesture would have maintained the race. The jockey would have gotten a, a fine or suspension, but there would have never been any change to the order finish. Arlington again comes into the fray in the 04 Arlington Million. Powers Court oh, sure. wins by a length and a half. Yep. Um, shifted in on Kick and Chris, and uh, the horse ends up uh, getting demoted, and Kick and Chris is, is, is promoted to the win. It's happened in, in plenty of big races uh, where the stewards have gotten involved and taken a look at things. Um, you know, an example that many people want to use is the Breeders' Cup Classic from 2014, Bayern. Uh, there's no argument that Bayern shifting in at the start greatly impacts shared belief, impacted Moreno, changed maybe the pace construction of that race. Bayern still won by three and three-quarter lengths. And it's very difficult to prove that uh, either shared belief or Moreno would have finished in front of Bayer. That race probably doesn't even get a look because the margin is, is so substantial. Uh, the, the key takeaway here, Pete, is that it is impossible to garner a system that is entirely fair for every example. Okay, There is no entirely equitable rules, interference, philosophy that can be applied. So we're trying to find the best alternative to that entirely fair result, which we know is, is just unattainable. In category one, the best horse is respected the most. Okay, the horse that is 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 considered to be the, the kind of the, the, the best uh, on the day tends to get their uh the most respect from the stewards because you have to believe that if that interference had it occurred, that horse was going past anyway. It feels and, like you get to play very, God less. Very difficult to it, does that make sense? You get to play God less in a sense with the category one rules. And you're absolutely right that yes. they're, they're not, they're far from perfect. I mean, I'm a believer, but then again, like if we have the category two rules and Byron still doesn't come down, then what's the point at all? The maddening inconsistency that the, the playing God that the stewards are required to do in category two makes me inclined to accept your, your premise here. But I'm glad you point out that it's still not perfect because there's plenty of examples where it isn't fair to that horse who probably should have gotten second or, or third. But I guess in a, in a weird way, you're suggesting that the, this is a, a lesser of evils. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, absolutely. A hundred percent. Now, it has to come with a legitimate penalty structure for jockeys, something that's actually meaningful, something that's not going to inspire riders to take chances and to ride in a dangerous fashion and the, and the paper addresses all of that but two of the stewards uh that we quote in this paper scott cheney from california and eddie arroyo from illinois both of whom presented at the uh, global symposium on racing out at the university of arizona last uh last december december 2017 and in that uh, scott cheney says very clearly as a steward sitting in the stand I like category one because everybody kind of agrees what the result's going to be. It's straightforward. Right. And Eddie Arroyo says <clears throat> it's, it made it much simpler that if, if the, the stewards at Arlington have looked at their rulings with the category two mindset, but then afterwards they'll go back and look at it from a category one mindset and say, we always came to the same conclusion and we'd come to the conclusion fast. Uh, category one simplifies what the stewards do, and it brought about a greater degree of consistency. So, so that's those are the words of of, of stewards uh, that, that we we quote in the paper. 
you know, the, the, the consistency, that, or rather the inconsistency that is being dealt with day in and day out from players who are playing across jurisdictions, okay? They're playing Mahoning Valley. They're playing San Anita. They're playing Portland Meadows. They're playing Sam Houston. They're all over the place. The, the rules themselves, as they are written, are the cause of the inconsistency, right. not the stewards. That's it's very the interesting. The fault here is not the humans who are up in the booth. It's the rules that allow them so much leeway to be subjective. And if they're going to be in subjective... Category one... Yeah. Oh, you go ahead. I, I I have the next point I want to make, but or next question yeah. I want to ask. But you finish your thought. If we're we're begging for a system that is consistent, understandable, uh, straightforward for owners, gamblers to understand, certainly for jockeys to understand, uh, that's the category one brings that about. As I said, it, it's not it's not the stewards who are who are the problem. It's the rules the rules enable them to be as subjective as they are. That increased subjectivity is what leads to the inconsistencies that, that are really quite maddening. And we outline a variety of examples of, of that. It's not good for the game. It's not good for customer confidence. It's not good for stakeholder participation. This is something that we think if America adopted it, it would yield a far more consistent sport, a far more consistent experience with much fewer demotions. The rates of demotions in countries where Category 1 exists are so much lower than they are right now in, in, in North America. It's, it's not even funny. Um, the estimate, if, if we applied the uh, the same rate of demotions as exists in the, in the United Kingdom, we took the numbers from 2017, and just uh, purely on, on that rate alone in North America there would have been only 81 demotions, okay? 81 demotions from 42,000 races in North America in 2017 if the Great British rate of demotions was applied. Now, that's meaningful because in just the Southern California circuit alone in 2017, there were 36 demotions, (laughs) okay, from 1,800 races. So um, we, we think it's, it, it, it's the sort of change that a lot of players can get behind. It's consistent. It's, it's very friendly to the best horse, and, and it yields a far more consistent experience for customers. In your research, you talked about how subjective – the current structure is, and we've all seen it, and 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 that's the points that make us the craziest, as we've ba- banged the drum for many times on the show. The inconsistency and the lack of communication about them in a category two world, at the very least, why aren't there detailed explanations of stewards' decisions, either in real time or thereafter on on a, a website? So at least we can try to see what they were seeing in the moment when they make these big decisions. Did you do any work in this regard? And what are your thoughts on the matter generally? Well, we've offered it in terms of uh, some considerations that need to happen and, and, and how communication needs to be a part of, of a switch um, and, and it's and it really does come down to a, a respect for the customers of the sport. Um, I, I personally think that part of the problem is that stewards too often are just kind of upstairs and out of the, the limelight, and they're just kind of in their room and they're, they're focused on doing their work, and and they don't really have to interact much. But we've seen cases where in New York there will be a, a reading of some sort of script about what what the decision was. At Keeneland uh, and in Kentucky, the, the stewards may post something to uh, the Keeneland website uh, soon after a race is ended with a, with a brief explanation. And in New York, or rather in California, the, uh, Trevor Denman or, or Michael Rona will be asked to, to give an explanation over the, the public address system. That's all well and helpful uh, to some degree. Okay, so, so, so we're not against that at all here uh, the problem is when there is so much subjectivity, any explanation for the current rules could almost always be combated by a slightly different opinion. Sure. Okay. Um, in, in category one, 
the only degree of subjectivity is to guess whether, had the interference not occurred, the horse that suffered the interference was going to finish in front of the interfering horse. It, it, it's a that decision, as opposed to, to to a better placing in category two, finishing in front of the horse that interfered with it. It's much easier to picture that. Yeah. And an explanation, you know, while it can certainly be given, you almost don't need it in category one. People understand; they know what the what the issue is. And, and I'll use the Japanese example. So Japan uh, shifted over from category two to category one uh, in 2013. And in the paper, we uh, we quote uh, one of the. Uh, Japan uh, Racing Association stewards who was instrumental in the, in the process and the communication of this. And he said the JRA would often get frequent number of calls and complaints to their customer service division based on the decisions of stewards. And he said, after a few months, when we switched from category two to category one, basically the number of calls went away. Uh, customers stopped complaining because they understood what the burden was to warrant a demotion or not. And uh, it's funny, uh, these remarks were made in, in Arizona at that symposium in 2017, a fellow, the gentleman is at Sushi Koya, and Mr. Koya goes on to basically say, they just started complaining about other things, bad <laughs> customer service, the tellers weren't doing things correctly, you know, but, but they just stopped complaining about the stewards. That's pretty funny. And he said it was really a, a remarkable impact uh, to see that, that that had kind of gone away. Now, there is a, there's a sub-argument here as well, Pete, that we live in a much more globalized sport now. This is a very, uh, it's a sport that reaches you know, so many different places. Uh, and it's worth noting that in 2018, at the beginning of this year, Germany and France became the last European countries to make the change from Category 2 over to Category 1. And Panama was the last country uh, in uh, Central or South America that was holding out. They have also made the change. So right now we are on a true island in the, the, the racing world operating under a Category 2 rules philosophy. Everyone else has switched to Category 1, and they've done it at varying speeds and over time. And you know, Again, we, we note the Japanese numbers, which I think are, are pretty compelling, and I think it's worth mentioning them here that in the last year of Category 1 uh, for the Japan Racing Association races, 3,400 races that they had in 2012, they had 143 inquiries and 14 demotions. So that was the last full year. 143 inquiries, 14 demotions. In the five full years since that time, they've had just more than 80 inquiries total and just uh, 11 demotions. So in five years of switching, they have not uh, matched the total number of inquiries or demotions that they had in the last single year of uh, Category 2 in their races. It's a very straightforward approach. It, it, I, I do admire that. And like we said, there's nothing that's going to be perfect. And I definitely would want to think it through a little bit more and do a little bit more study, which I'm sure that, that a lot of this is probably covered already in the white paper. But, you know, you always worry about law of unintended consequences kind of things that, that, that could crop up, but especially coupled with more of the penalties and, and clear penalties for dangerous riding and things like that. It just seems like a, a very straightforward way to go that would eliminate some of that, those consistency and communication issues that make players crazy and erode our confidence and make it harder for us to bet our money. What about the process from here, Pat? What is What are the next steps for you uh, as an organization to try to get the USA to, to go along with the rest of the world in this regard? So this uh, topic that we discussed was really the first time that it's been really approached in the mainstream, and we would like to continue to discuss it in that mainstream forum. But um, in order to, to facilitate the change happening, um, the racing officials accreditation program is involved. 
Uh, the Model Rules Committee in December out in, in Tucson would have to be involved as well uh, to, to talk about adjusting uh, a model rule. Now, there is a model rule that could be adopted and put in place, and then states can individually approve that. Um, that's probably the path that this goes down. Now, it's also entirely possible that individual state jurisdictions determine at some point that this is what they want to do. Um, and they could kind of jump the queue and they don't have to wait for the model rule to happen. They could just do it themselves. I don't necessarily see that happening, but we will be supporting uh, an adjustment to the model rules to get this to go through. This is, we view this as a modernization uh, of rules in the sport, particularly in a sport where people are betting across multiple jurisdictions um, and they are, uh, they're experiencing uh, the sport in so many different ways in so many different places. It shouldn't have to be that a takedown in one jurisdiction is not a takedown in another. The rules should be the same uh, for that. And that's why it becomes kind of so, so clear and so vivid that it's something that should be adopted. But the, the way in which that adoption would happen, we believe would come through the adoption of a model rule. So the model rules committee will be there in December to talk to them about this and to support this. And then it would be up for, for states thereafter, if, if that model rule does get approved, to, to go forward and adopt it. The last time there has been a change to the rules philosophy in North America happened really in the 1930s through the 1950s. It used to be that any foul in a race, you were simply placed last. And that was just viewed as unrealistic. You know, two horses that were well clear of the others, there was a foul and there was some bumping and just a horse would, would end up getting placed last. Things evolved, but it took over two decades for that evolution to take place. It really shouldn't take as long for something like this to take place. And to reference the point you made earlier, Pete, about unintended consequences, absolutely the, the concern amongst people is that this could yield a racing, a race riding uh, culture it is more dangerous that um, jockeys take more chances. Um, we cannot overstate this enough. The safety of horses and jockeys is absolutely of paramount concern, no matter what the rules philosophy is. And the stewards must be empowered to ensure that jockeys are doing their job in a safe fashion for everybody, that everyone is legitimately credentialed to be riding that new apprentices are skilled enough to not create excessive hazards. All of that awareness has to be there. But what has been found is that countries that have made the switch, they are simply not replete with carnage from racing where few horses are demoted due to interference. It, it just has not materialized. Believe it or not, this was actually the concern back in the 1930s when we saw the, the last interference uh, philosophy change in North America. And we, we quote some of the old daily racing film stories about this, oh, great. where there was a steward from Detroit who said, any concerns that jockeys were going to take more chances because they weren't going to be put to last um, has not materialized. So it, it, it continues to be up to the stewards to police that appropriately and strongly and ensure that, that it's a very uh, safe sport and engaging for, uh, for, for everybody to understand the rules, uh, what is or is not dangerous, and to ensure that a penalty structure, and we, we outlined some of these in the paper, that the penalty structure appropriately meets that. It's been suggested before that perhaps to some sort of centralized authority making the subjective category two type decisions as opposed to having stewards at each track might improve uh, the consistency, et cetera, putting aside the impracticality of that under racing's current structure. Do you think the switch to category one obviates the need for any sort of centralized ruling authority? 100%. Um, the number of reviewed incidents would decline so much so that a, a central body would probably have about one or two incidents to review per day as opposed to where they are right now, which would be significantly higher. But we, we also, though, identify, Pete, that, that we think the comparison is faulty, okay, that, that, that the concept of the central office in racing using the infrastructure comparison to, say, basketball or, or baseball or football 
uh, is just not the same. Okay. Uh, those centralized replay structures in other sports rely on the officials making a live time, real speed call. And the replay center is then asked to verify whether that call was accurate or not in the confines of a live officiated event, that central structure makes sense. But in horse racing, any adjudication of the race is happening after the race, entirely with the benefit of slow motion and replay. Stewards aren't making a live call. Right. So what the what that would essentially be doing is then saying that um, the professional sport would have a centralized body making every call. Balls and strikes would be called. Uh, incomplete passes would be called, everything would be called by the central office. So that's why we think the comparison's a little faulty there. Makes Um, sense. Ignoring, like you said, all of the other considerations. All right, Pat Cummings of the Thoroughbred Idea Foundation. The paper is called Changing the Rules. You can find it at racingthinktank.com. Pat, thanks for your time today. Thanks so much, Pete. And that's going to do it for this episode of the DRF Players Podcast. Thank you, J.K. Thank you, Pat Cummings. Thanks most of all to all of you for listening. We will be back before the weekend. Not sure when the show will go up, but we're going to talk about these Thanksgiving races. I think we'll record Wednesday. Maybe we can get it up on Wednesday, and you can listen then. Hopefully, we will have some good information and ideas about a very cool uh, weekend slate of races. Until then... I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornital. May you win all your photos.